Yeah, welcome to Community Board 8 Speaks. Well, I'm very excited tonight. We have a guest who has really impacted the lives of thousands of men here in New York City, uh, giving them hope and jobs and housing. Many of them are ex-offenders that are struggling with drug or alcohol addiction. We're familiar with uh, these gentlemen on the streets so that make our lives better. They're the men in blue of ready, willing, and able, and they're part of the Doe Fund. And I'm very proud today to welcome George T. McDonald, uh, the founder and president of the Doe Fund. So thank you so much for David, coming. it's my pleasure to be here. Please, you know, give us a little bit about your background. I know you've been an activist, a community leader for years. I actually uh, started uh, uh, a public career in uh, uh, New York City when I ran for Congress in 1980 on the Upper East Side. Uh, I was uh, trying to fashion being the poorest man uh, running against the richest man, who was Bill Green at that time. He was the richest man in the house. So that didn't work out. But a woman uh, uh, died in the Grand Central Terminal of malnutrition uh, in 1984. She literally starved to death. And I read about it in the, in, in the newspaper. And I thought, you know, go find out why. How is this possible in the richest country, in the richest city in the world, that somebody could literally starve to death right in front of us? And so I went to Grand Central in 1984. As I was feeding the people, I got to know them. And I did it for, for 700 nights in a row, two years. And I listened to what the people said. And over and over again, I heard George appreciate the sandwich, but what I'm really looking for is a room and a job. A room and a job to pay for it. A room and a job to pay for it. And I said to myself, this, that makes sense. If I were indigent and I was looking for a way up, it would be through work. And I was lucky enough to meet a beautiful woman that uh, was a screenwriter from Beverly Hills who had uh, written a screenplay about one of the young ladies who killed herself in Grand Central that I knew and I had been feeding, and uh, Harriet Carr was her name, originally from uh, the village, and uh, uh, we got married, started uh, Ready, Willing, and Able together, uh, and uh, have done it uh, for all of these years since, uh, but it was based on listening to what the people said that they thought the solution to their problem was, not me telling them what I thought the solution to their problem was. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Doe Fund? All these years later, I can say that group of ragtag people, everybody thought we were too lazy or crazy to uh, actually go to work and do anything productive, have turned in uh, an organization that's done almost $900 million in revenue since 1990, uh, graduated from our uh, program, which is nine to 12 months, uh, over 20,000 men. Uh, we, uh, we have an organization that currently is about $55 million in revenue, and we have 1,000 people in our care uh, every day. We provide economic opportunity for people through paid transitional work. They go out and they work for money. And we give all of the social service supports that they need in the areas of their life that need improvement. And we provide housing, transitional temporary housing. So that's a three-legged stool that winds up with four or 500 employers in New York City hiring our guys when they graduate. And oh, by the way, we drug test twice a week and they pay child support. So they're productive, contributing members of society. They're exactly what we all want for them and what they want for themselves. And all it's really taken is to provide an opportunity for people to help themselves. You have a large veteran population? We have historically and traditionally uh, between 17 and 20 percent of the folks in our program uh, are veterans. What is the difference between traditional housing and shelters or transitional I have housing? To, I, say? I have to say, first of all, we in New York City are the most generous people on the planet. We have a thing called the right to shelter. 
which means that anybody that lives in New York City or anybody that comes from any other jurisdiction in the world and comes to New York City, we will make sure that they have a place to sleep tonight. So they go to Bellevue, the, the uh, former uh, hospital, and they present themselves and they check into our system. So the first housing is a shelter. Now that shelter, uh, uh, it, it, depending on who runs it and where it is, meaning that the first check-in is run by the city, and that historically has not been the best, and the city recognizes that, and the city is making improvements to that. But in the Dinkins administration, we got the city to basically contract out the shelter system to not-for-profits like the Doe Fund. And there are uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 different organizations that provide not only the shelter, but services. So these are transitional facilities that people, like in our facility, they spend the 9 to 12 months. Uh, and then they move on to the next uh, housing, which I'll describe in a second. But the important thing is that these transitional facilities have programs, that they're not just beds mm. for people to sleep in, but they have programs that get the people out of the situation that they're in. So, for example, uh, somebody that's chronically and persistently mentally ill. Well, we don't want to keep them in a transitional shelter, but they go into what's called supportive housing which is the next area of housing. So we build supportive housing for people who move from the transitional shelter system into permanent supportive housing. So for example, many years ago, the Community Board Aid uh, supported the Doe Fund when we established a, what's called a better place on East 86th Street uh, between 1st and 2nd Avenue. That's a residence for 24 people living with HIV AIDS. And that's 17 years old. Uh, so uh, that's, and, and at that time people were dying, uh, but because of the advancement in pharmaceuticals, people live longer and now they live there and we get them into the next step, which is affordable permanent housing without any social services other than, you know, wh whatever they, they need. To, but, but basically the goal always is towards independence. What type of funding are you getting, whether it's city or state uh, or, or private contributions? What's the breakdown of that and well, what are the challenges? It, it, it's always challenging to, to raise money. And, and, and of course, we know, and I don't mean this in any pejorative way, but, the, but African-American men haven't been on the top of uh, the list of uh, philanthropy in America. Um, so it is not the easiest thing in the world to go out. So we first said... Before anybody will give us any money, we have to show that the people themselves want to work and will do what they're expected of them, and they did. So that was a contract with the Dinkins administration that we got from Ed Koch, actually. It began the first day of David Dinkins' administration in 1990 and was for $2 million, and it was to basically repair vacant city-owned apartments uh, that in those days had been burned up with a, a crack fire or, uh, you know, remove uh, 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 plaster and, uh, and paint and uh, do all kinds of improvements on these city-owned apartments. And we used the folks from the shelter system, sent them out every day with our bands to work sites, and they did the work and we paid them for it. Then that was the first three years from 1990. Then the Giuliani got elected mayor, and he decided to sell off the city-owned buildings, and that cut our work in half. So instead of having work for 70 people, we now had a million-dollar contract, 35 guys with no work, and facing bankruptcy right three years after we started. And my wife and I had put up our house <laughs> to guarantee the bank loan to start. So I said, okay. Let's buy uniforms, let's put the American flag on their sleeve and our logo on the back and we'll put them on East 86th Street, you know, our office and home. Still, we work in our offices on East 84th Street. And I said, they'll sweep up, it's dirty, it needs to... And people will come up to them and ask them who they are and why they're doing it and then they will come and support us. 
And again, everybody thought, well, you're out of your mind. You know, you can't do that. Well, we did it, you know, and uh, now we do $55 million a year in revenue. And uh, uh, we, we have uh, a third of our budget is raised through uh, private uh, donations. And a third of it is raised through uh, uh, the city. And a third of it is raised through work that we get paid for by the business improvement districts and all of that. But it was just that. It, it was in those days, and I would use this as, as, as an example for any young people that may see the, the show. Uh, the key to life is solving your own problems. Nobody's going to come and do it for you. Uh, but yet uh, what we did uh, collectively uh, uh, with the community was not go to City Hall and yell and scream. Uh, you know, give us more funding, give us more funding. We went to the community and we said, we have a good idea. This is a good idea. We know you want to help these people. This is structured properly. Let's do this together. And we did, and we still do. And that's a great thing. It really is a great, great thing. It's, it's really impressive what your organization is doing to help the lives of people. The staff uh, that you have at the Doe Fund, do you have caseworkers, social workers? Oh, sure. We have uh, 450 employees that are, are full-time employees of the Doe Fund. So we're a large organization. And I should say that 70% of those 450 employees are graduates of our program. I mean, some of them are program managers and, and high-priced executives, I might add. So it's really an organization of the people, by the people, and for the people, and that's what makes it work. Somebody, it's not me saying you should do this, it's somebody else who's done it, and it's helped them be a father, be a husband, be a contributing member of society. Uh, and what's interesting over here is that people don't really realize that. So you take the Doe Fund and we created these jobs, not the jobs that our graduates get with the employers, but the jobs that just Harriet Carr McDonald, my wife and I created starting in 1990. Now, because we measure everything, we know how much money we've spent on everything cumulatively since 1990. And one of the interesting things that we know is that we paid $74 million to the federal government for the employment taxes on the jobs that we created. That's how you create taxes. That's how you improve the economy. You create jobs. And those, the people pay the taxes from those jobs. I mean, it's an amazing concept. But imagine that. You're looking at a guy who earned $74 million for the federal government as a byproduct of trying to go out and help homeless people in Grand Central Terminal. What a great country this is. I mean, it really is. Imagine that. That's exceptional. Now, uh, a, a minimum wage or a living wage, how does that affect your organization? Well, see, and, and, and there, there's a, a, another thing that... That as a businessman, I would tell you, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to do this? Because it's seven and a half dollars and now it's $15 in, in, in two years. Uh, it, it, as, a, uh, as a human being who has observed the last 30 years in our country, I say, how can I not do it? So we have always paid above the minimum wage. And I have always been a proud, a proud of that because people, you know... There are critics in, in every, I mean, they're people who are just born. Some people do be critics. And the critics would say, oh, he's paying them the minimum wage and all of that stuff. So we always paid them up the minimum wage to show that we valued the people more than that. But now the governor, Andrew Cuomo, has a, 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 a wonderful uh, program raised the minimum wage, and now it's $11 an hour. It'll be $13 an hour next year and $15 an hour the year after that. Well, when we started in 1990, a security guard would get $19,500 a year. Well, last year, a security guard would get $19,500 a year, and this is from 1990 till now. So it hasn't changed. I want them to change. So the fact that I have to pay for it 
<laughs> you know, well, that's just your problem. So how do you do that? Eventually, some of the contracts that we have uh, get edged up in, in salary and it gets adjusted. It has a disproportionate effect on organizations that employ people, uh, a majority of their people in the lower rung of salary because now the minimum wage at $15 an hour is going to be $31,000 a year. Well, we pay people above the minimum wage between you know, the 20,000 and 31. So all of those people have to go up. So the city, in their infinite wisdom, understands this. We have a contract for a facility that will be opening after uh, the $15 an hour minimum wage. And let's just say our day rate now would be $90 a day. It'll double. So that's the impact that the minimum wage is going to have. So each individual that, that works, your clients, are they going to get the full minimum wage or do you deduct something for their housing? The first thing that we deduct is for the savings. Mm -hmm. So they have to save $1,000 and we match that with $1,000 when they graduate. Uh, we make them, uh, uh, they pay a, a, a program service fee that covers a, a little bit of a room and board type thing to get them used to doing that when they graduate, and they have to pay child support. They have to sign up for it and, and get on it. Uh, but that's it. And then, you know, they get paid. And as I said before, we drug test twice a week. Generational uh, 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 effect is, is really something to see. These, these men become proud fathers to their children. We cannot afford to lose another generation of children to incarceration. And that's what we're doing if we don't provide opportunity for the fathers. So now I'm in this position where I'm changing my life and my son is getting older. It makes me feel good where I could grab him like, come on Kyrie, let's go to the park or let's go get something to eat. I wouldn't give it away for the world. Like, I, I love that film. I love it. It's good. It's great. Spending time with my son is everything. It's, it's my happiness. It's my peace of mind. It's my clarity. It's my truth. It's me. We love people. We want to help people. We do it very well. We can do it better tomorrow than we've done it today. We can help more people next week than we did last. My question to you is, is it sizable? And can this be replicated anywhere else in the country? Yeah, well, uh, is it scalable? Yes. Uh, we've gone through the trial and error process of, of, of doing that. We were in Jersey City for uh, 15 years uh, until the mayor decided that we wouldn't be there anymore. We've been in Philadelphia for 17 or 18 years, and they love us, and uh, we're now going to uh, give them autonomy. Uh, we're working out a, a national replication model with some uh, uh, very, very uh, wonderful people from our community board uh, who are interested in doing it. Uh, it works because work works and opportunity works and, and with the right structure and, and, and the right attitude, uh, you can provide a, a set of circumstances where people will prosper. Have you ever calculated or estimated, you know, what it would cost for a gentleman to go through the program and the benefits of this person being independent, uh, taking care of his children, uh, the actual benefit, the, the, the monetary value to that? 3.6. Mm. 3.6. Uh, uh, we had a, a study that uh, a large accounting firm did, and it showed for every dollar that was invested in the program, uh, 3.6 in societal benefit, both the value of the actual work that they do mm -hmm. and then uh, all of the things that don't happen. Don't go to Rikers Island. That's right. Don't go to Attica. Don't go to the precinct. Don't use the cops' time. You know all of, all of those things and and the benefit. It did not measure the generational effect. And you referred to it a little earlier, and we both know uh, that it does have a positive effect on the next generation of children if their father is working and has hope. And, you know, is involved in their life. Have you ever been in a situation where the city or state has tried to force clients on that you, you did not think was a good match or a good we, fit, we, fit we, for them? We actually had a, a, 
uh, a recent, uh, somewhat recent uh, example of that when early on in uh, my friend uh, uh, in Mayor de Blasio's term, uh, a commissioner of his uh, got, a, 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 got behind the eight ball with uh, uh, sex offenders. And uh, again, we have the right to shelter and we have to shelter everybody. And that includes sex offenders that are discharged from uh, prisons upstate. Um, and he was uh, uh, in a panic, I guess, and he decided that uh, he was going to put 50 of them in our 400-bed uh, ready, willing, and able program in, in uh, uh, East Williamsburg because it wasn't near a school, which is part of the... Well, of course, that would have ruined our program. It would have just... You know, because nobody would hire any of our graduates after that, and we couldn't put a person in our uniform and then send them out to clean a park or a, or buy a school or any of that kind of thing. So we had to sue the city. We, you know, I mean, all of those things you don't do. <laughs> I thought you said you were a politician. I, well, but <laughs> the compromise part of the politics, which is, I do believe in, uh, prevailed. And we were able to uh, negotiate a, a, an outcome that uh, was beneficial both to the city and to the Doe Fund. What can the community board do to assist your organization? I would just back it up just a, a little bit and say, uh, if we can push the business improvement district for East 86th mm -hmm. Street over the goal line this time, the, the third time in my lifetime maybe that, uh, the, that, that we're here, uh, that would be a big win. Now, that doesn't mean that the, that the new bid would hire the Doe Fund. Mm. That means that they would put out a request for contracts uh, for people to apply, and we would apply. And if we were fortunate enough to win, we would win. But I, as a citizen, having used the resources of the, the Doe Fund for 15 years to clean up East 86th Street for free mm -hmm. until <laughs> we couldn't any longer really, really, really would like for East 86th Street to have a bid because I would like to be able to walk down the street and know that these vendors that are all, that it looks like a third world country and it shouldn't. I mean, look at the magnificence of the building and the residences and the people that live there. We deserve better than that. And we're so close. So uh, that's, uh, that's one way that we can all help us generally. And the other way, I, I think that specifically for the Doe Fund, that I don't know that, that we would get more work, more business, uh, if you will, uh, from the Upper East Side, uh, other than more contributions so that we can put more people out. I mean, that's the direct relationship. But what people can do is go to our website and look how they can volunteer and do mock interviews with guys as they're getting ready to get their jobs and that kind of thing. And talk to their employers about how uh, we can uh, perhaps introduce one or two of our graduates who are ready for full-time work into their organization, into their company, because we stand behind them. And Are there any vocations or training you'd like to see your graduates go into? We're interested in the ambulant business, for example, because that's a personal care business mm -hmm. that'll never re uh, be replaced by driverless uh, cars because somebody has to go up the stairs. And, and with the, uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, new ways that uh, ambulatory care of getting back and forth to a hospital rather than staying there uh, and doesn't rise to the level of of an ambulance. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. We'd, and anybody that has any ideas about labor intensive work that generates revenue that supports the person so that we can pay them, we're very interested in that. Because that's the key. We have to, we, technology not trade is what's happened in America. I mean, the, they, they can talk about unfair trade, that's not what's caused the imbalance in, in the, the workforce. It's technology. We need to train people, but we also need to provide for people's hands, people that, that, that can work, that want to work. We have to provide things for them. We're smart enough to figure out what these things are. I just need a little help from you in determining what they are.
What has been the best success story uh, that comes to mind? I think the generosity of the people of New York City is an example that lights the way for the rest of the world. So that's the best success story. I'm, I'm happy that I found my way to this great place and can do a little bit. Specifically, there was a fellow two weeks ago, Terrence Coffey, who just graduated from New York University uh, with his master's in social work at the top of his class, who first graduated from the Doe Fund and then went on to get his undergraduate degree at NYU and his master's at NYU. So he, a graduate of our program, turns out to be better educated than the founders of it, <laughs> which I think is an amazing success story. So I'll end it there. I want to thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your thoughts and talking about the Doe Fund and all the great work you do here in the city. It's opened my eyes. I don't look at your, your team now as just the guys cleaning the street, but a program that's in really enriching their lives and their families' lives. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, sir, a, for having me. It's my pleasure.